and welcome to Lunchtime Politics, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzoro. Here's what's coming up on the program right now. It's finally home sweet home for abducted students of Kuriga community. Uh, secondary school who were abducted have now been released by the abductors. Governor Sani commends the president, the military, for the efforts in ensuring a smooth operation. And a dead toll in a stampede during a palliative distribution in Bauchi State rises to seven, comprising children and the elderly, all female. And the federal government has filed a tax evasion charges against cryptocurrency exchange platform Binance, maintaining its aim is to protect Nigeria's economic integrity. <coughs> Let's kick off the first edition of the program for the week with what appears like a swipe by the FCT minister at his political opponent. Mr. Wiki at an event has challenged who some persons consider to be targeted at his successor to show proof of stewardship since assumption of office, juxtaposing it with his time as governor. This is how he puts it. If you know you have what it takes, appear before the press, talk with the press, live coverage, let them ask you question, and you talk. Let's see. I talk with the press every day. I said, ask me a question. The hospital at the garrison junction, I completed it. I furnished it. And I said, look, let this thing be part of your 100 days in office. Go and commission them. Do you report con convocation arena, which I gave to somebody who said he would also have master and boy, I paid 98 cents. I said, make sure you commission it 100 days in office. So as he came, they said, oh, wrong, don't commission. He said, well, you will be taking the credit. What's my business? If you commission, you don't commission. What's my business? The record is there. The road for Sadiwa, the road for Sadiwa, to Duala Sadiwa, to Kono. I started it. I finished it. The entire road in Emeka, Emeka. I hear somebody there now says, don't worry, God will put everybody back. Well, with reverse politics, you may never predict what happens. So that's how we get started on the first edition of the program for the week. But away from politics, the death toll in a tragic stampede during an arms-giving program in Bauchi has now risen to seven, according to the State Police Command. Six of the victims died at the Bubaka Tafar Belawa University Teaching Hospital, while one person lost a life at home. Providing the latest updates on the incident, Ahmed Wakling, the public relations officer of the Bauchi State Command, shared the details of the persons who died to include uh, persons ages, aging, ages ranging from 8 to 55, and they are all females. Recall that a large number of residents had gathered at Shafa Holding Company PLC along Just Road in Bauchi Metropolis on Sunday to receive 10,000 naira each as arms for the poor, generously provided by philanthropists. However, chaos ensued, resulting in that very sad incident known as the Stumpy. Well, it's a different story from Kaduna State. With the release of 137 school children who were abducted from Kuriga community over two weeks ago, they were released in neighboring Zamfara State on Sunday, and they, were, they are expected to be handed over to the state governor, Mr. Ubersani, uh, in the next hour. The governor will confirm their rescue commended the president and security agencies for their role in ensuring the release of the children. Parents had also raced to the government house in Kaduna State with the hope of reuniting with their children. 
March 7th, a day never to be forgotten by the people of Kuriga community. Bandits attacked the Lea Primary School and Government Secondary School, both located in Chikun local government area of Kaduna State, abducting scores of school children in the process. The attack, considered one of the biggest mass abduction in recent times, also sparked national and international outrage. In the aftermath of the incident, a teacher from the school had told Governor Basani during his visit to Kuriga community that over 200 children were abducted and taken to an unknown destination. Determined to rescue the abducted school children, Governor Sonny, in collaboration with security agencies, swung into action, and two weeks after, their efforts paid off. The children are rescued in the early hours of Sunday in neighboring Zamfara State through the joint efforts of the military and local authorities. The military authorities, however, put the number of abducted students at 137, comprising 76 females and 61 males, all between the ages of 5 and 15 years. The excited parents are waiting to be reunited with their children. I'm here in the government house to receive my child as the government calls us to, to see our child. But we are here even though we've not seen them, but we have been assured, we've been informed by the governor himself that these are children are with them. They are taking care of them by tomorrow. They want to do some, you know, they want to maybe give them some something. By tomorrow, after treating them, they'll hand over the children to, the, to their parents. My daughter is, is just nine years old. We've been feeling very bad, very, very bad, because we cannot expect a small child, seven years, nine years, ten years, you know, in this, in the hands of bandits. How, you know, no food, you know, no drinking water. So how do you, how do you, in fact, you have to feel very, you know, you just have to, how will you feel if it's your child? <laughs> Meanwhile, as part of efforts to beef up security in vulnerable communities, a contingent of 200 police special intervention forces have been deployed to Kuriga community by the Inspector General Police. They were received by the governor at the government house ahead of their deployment. I'm happy that they are back home now. They are with us. And police have played a major role in bringing these children back home. I want to thank the IG. I want to thank all the security agencies. I want to specially thank President Bola Majinibu. To the parents, to the community, uh, we congratulate them as well. And uh, we appeal to them that uh, they should accept them and uh, these children need to be treated very well because of what they passed through. And they need to go back to school as well. Although the mass kidnapping of students in the northwest geopolitical zone has reduced in recent months, the Kuriga abduction is a wake-up call for the government and security agencies to put more boots on the ground, especially in vulnerable communities where most of the attacks take place. <laughs> While well, speaking on our program politics today, Governor Obasani said that contrary to earlier reports quoting the number of abducted students uh, to be about 287, the actual figure is 137 school children comprising 76 females and 61 males. He adds that a teacher who was kidnapped alongside the pupils couldn't make it out alive as he developed some complications while in captivity. They are here in Kaduna. I have been working closely with the military uh, to ensure that uh, we look after them. Uh, and of course, uh, we are also trying as much as possible to give them some social uh, counseling and look after them before we eventually hand them over to the families. There was nobody that ever confirmed that the children were 287. But those numbers were just figment of some people's imaginations, which they just were to the media, I reported that uh, the figures were that. But today, I met the, the, the families with the children. They confirmed to me uh, that uh, the numbers given by the uh, military uh, are the correct numbers. Well, we're super glad that the children are back to, and they'll be reuniting with their parents.
uh, pretty soon. The governor is expected to uh, receive all of them in the next less than an hour from now. Exactly 1 p.m. is the scheduled time for them to meet with the governor at the government house. So we're following up on that particular story as uh, this particular phase we hope never happens again. But as you heard from the governor, the teacher who was, upset, who was also abducted couldn't make it out alive. Our thoughts and our prayers are the family of that particular teacher. And that's the focus of our conversation. This release of the children and insecurity generally in Nigeria. We're being joined by a former assistant director of the National Intelligence Agency, uh, Major Mohamed Galma. He joins us via Zoom. Major Galma, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Can you hear me, Major? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. If you can help me unmute your device so we can hear you. All right, so let, 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 but what goes into... Major, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. So I wanted to find out from you now, um, maybe you walk us through some of the few details that the public can maybe share in, in terms of what it takes to actually uh, ensure this smooth release or rescue, whichever name is called, in this kind of operation. Thank you very much, Dick. My name is what we call. I think this one is one of the smoothest operations I've ever, you know, heard of. And uh, I think taking consideration that um, I'm younger, so human beings are involved. And uh, with the number, again, you know, when I say the number, the population of the people, or this, this, the, this is some, somehow, you know, big. Uh, I'm sure. A very great care must have been taken, and there was uh, a lot of information must have been made, you know, for this successful, you know, quiet and uh, less casual uh, uh, operation. Because uh, in the beginning, we had a meeting that uh, we were told that those things were divided into three two, a one in one in the north, one in Zambara, one in Niger State. Surprisingly, now uh, the, the, the number has been abducted and been reduced in much, with more than 100. And then, where they are found is only in one state. So, that is uh, a very encouraging news. And the only thing I want to say here is please, we hope, we hope some parents not about to say their own and not come back. Then we start depression in the number of the actual people taken away because um it's, it's, it's simple to tell the people authority to tell the people but one there is going to be uh doubt all right, Major Kalm, uh, Gama, uh, we we barely could hear all the things you were saying we're trying to manage it but apparently we need to uh, work on reconnecting with you. So we'll take this quick break. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation. Join us again. Welcome back. Uh, we're still trying to establish that connection with Major Gama. We had technical, uh, you know, connection issues. But for now, we'll switch gears to so outside Nigeria to our correspondent who is in Dakar. Kela Megua is joining us uh, from Dakar, where she has been monitoring the presidential election in that country. Kela, uh, good afternoon to you. All right. Well, okay. Yes, again, uh, as soon as we get our connection with Kela. But let's tell you that the establishment of state police may not be the answer to insecurity challenges facing the country. That's, that position is posited by the security consultant, Mr. Cabrera Adamu. He believes that the current structure is standing on a faulty foundation because there is no accountability owing to the non-existence of key performance indicators. He was speaking in an exclusive interview with Channel Television. If we strengthen the m and &E component within the security sector, 
we didn't, so the executive arm, or all the security departments are within the security arm, and all of them, interestingly, do have m and &E sections. section. They have the standards, the military, if you go, they have the standards department, or whatever they want to call it. Then they also have m and &E units at the defense headquarters. Mm -hmm. So all we need to do is to strengthen these departments ensure that we have capable hands with those departments and empower them. Now what they will do is every time we have a policy, they will develop key performance indicators and then we can now measure the, the implementation of those KPIs. If we do create any institution with the current circumstances that, kind of that they have. Apart from the curriculum, with the absence of accountability within the system, that institution too will suffer the fate of all the federal institutions. So, Let's introduce accountability. Let's make sure that whatever um, function that we're created, it's accountable to us as Nigerians in the manner that every democratic system is set up, then we'll see the results. But if we don't do that and we go ahead to create another function, believe me, it will not give us the intention or the objective that we want. Uh, in collaboration with NSA and with the support of this. Uh, that uh, conversation with uh, Mr. Kabura Demo, you can catch it, the full interview tonight on Newsnight by 9 p.m. right here on Channels Television. Let's also tell you that the federal government has initiated a criminal proceedings against Binance, a prominent cryptocurrency exchange platform. The charges were filed on Friday, March the 23rd at the Federal High Court Abuja by the Federal Inland Revenue Service. The lawsuit implicates Binance with a four-count tax evasion ac accusation. Joined with the crypto company as second and the third defendants in the suit are Tigran Gambarian and Nadim Anjawala, both senior executives of Binance currently under the custody of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The charges level leveled against Binance include non-payment of value-added tax as a VAT, company income tax, failure to file tax returns and complicity, in aiding customers evade taxes through its platform. In the suit, the federal government also accuses Binance of failure to register with FIRS for tax purposes and contravening existing tax regulations within the country. Uh, so let's see how that plays out in court. We understand that Major Gauma is back with us as we continue that conversation on insecurity in the country, especially this release. Uh, good news from Kaduna State. Just trying to look at all that played out. Uh, Major, uh, if you can just, in one minute, uh, the question I asked about what goes into the release, whether it's a release or a, a, a rescue, oh, it wasn't quite clear because of technical connect, uh, because of co connection problems. Oh, apparently sometimes technology is not necessary that silver bullet we hope for a, a better time with a major on this particular issue let's tell you also that the federal government says it will complete the construction of six new cancer healthcare centers in Nigeria in the next two years this is according to the coordinating minister of health and social welfare professor Lipati the minister was speaking on our breakfast program, Sunrise Daily, says 37.4 billion naira has been allocated to the Federal Ministry of Health to enhance access to oncology care in different geopolitical zones which will be equipped with modern medical infrastructure. In collaboration with NSA and with the support of Mr. President, we signed an MOU which will expand in a very significant way, in fact, in an unprecedented way. Uh, cancer infrastructure and equipment in six federal tertiary hospitals across this country so that they have the linear accelerators, the brachytherapy, and the diagnostic equipment. Uh, believe you me, uh, there are times where there's only one linear accelerator functioning in this country. You have to travel from one place, of one part of the country to the other. And many Nigerians fly to Egypt, to Middle East, to other places for cancer therapy, for radiotherapy. Now we're going to solve it. Uh, with the uh, MOU that we signed uh, with the NSIA, with the approval of the president, uh, to go directly to the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, uh, to secure 
those uh, critical equipment to build, to embed them within the hospital infrastructures alongside the training of the personnel and maintenance arrangements for those cancer uh, therapy equipment. So that over time, Nigerians can be able to access those uh, uh, services that they need in the event that they have uh, cancers. In addition to that, we've restructured the Cancer Health Fund, which had existed in the past, which is supporting the poorest and vulnerable to cover the cost of cancer care. It is housed in the Ministry of Health. It has been there for some time. We restructured it, transferred it to the Nigerian Institute for Cancer Research and Treatment, NICRAD, so that we provide a safety net for the poor Nigerians who cannot afford the high cost of cancer uh, care in this country. This effort is to reposition the Cancer Health Fund so that for the vulnerable groups, uh, through the hospital where they are diagnosed and they are prescribed the medications to de deal with their cancers or the therapies that they need, the payment for that can be uh, subsidized using a pool of public resources but based on need. And that's the idea of the Cancer Health Fund. And that is now uh, uh, transferred to NICROD, and I believe that we will expand that over time. Within 18 to 24 months, the facilities will have been completed, equipment on ground, people trained, and the, uh, uh, the maintenance agreements in place. Because the bunkers have to be built, the equipment has to be, they're not sitting on the shelf, uh, you, but you have to commit. And that's why we went uh, to, uh, uh, through NSIA, because there's an existing uh, procurement process and uh, contract with uh, these manufacturers to say, look, let's just do it. And this is something that once you do it, it will take decades riding on the back of it. And then you can do something else. Next year, it may be some other aspect of our problems that we can tackle. But there's no amount of money that can equate to the life of mm -hmm. someone who suffers from uh, cancer. We hope and pray that this comes through because it's really going to help a lot of people. And we must apologize again for uh, the connection challenges we had. Uh, we wanted to really talk about the security issues. But let's tell you also that the governor of Adama State, Omar Fintri, has reiterated his resolve to sustaining the peace project in the state. The governor made this known during the year's Quetta Cultural Festival in Lamode, local government area of the state. According to the governor, the presence of peace or peace will create a conducive atmosphere for farming activities. The Equator Cultural Festival is an annual event organized by the Batama Traditional Council of Adama State. It is an event which helps in promoting the cultural values and heritage of the people. The festival also marks the end of one farming season and the beginning of another. The Equity Festival, which provides an opportunity for thanksgiving and prayers for another favorable farming season, attracts people from the Batama Kingdom, neighboring local government areas, neighboring states, and tourists from across the country. I oh, apologize for that as well. Uh, but let's now head down to Dhaka in Senegal, where our correspondent Kela Magua is standing by to bring you. Bring us the uh, latest as far as that election is concerned. Kayla, good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, yes, sure. I wanted to be sure I can see you clearly. Uh, good afternoon to you. Well, good afternoon to you and good morning. Over yeah, here. I know good it's morning. morning. I need to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should just say good afternoon. Give us the latest as to what's going on in, in Dakar. Yes, uh, so the elections uh, started early yesterday as we were protest started at 8 a.m. Everybody was out early, which was. Uh, 7.3 million voters and they have diaspora voting in Dakar so um, you know I was wanting to see how all of that will happen but the elections happen you know and finished on time the election materials came early most observers have described this particular election as well coordinated in fact as of right now that we're speaking uh, the local media in Senegal is reporting that Basiru Diomaye Diyaka Faye uh, has some sort of lead in the elections of course. the Constitution Council of um, of Senegal will be the ones to give the elections. The elections here are managed by our version of the Ministry of Interior. So uh, the Constitution Council will be the ones to give the results. And, and their, their indices are a little different. Uh, you need more than 50% of the votes, which is which is dicey because we're seeing 19 people vying for this one. So to get over 50%, 
something to watch and see how that pans out. But we're watching, you know, all of the, you know, all of the happenings, you know, just so we can understand how this is going to happen. If someone doesn't doesn't get more than 50% of the votes, then they'll have to do the elections again in another two weeks. And everyone is hoping that doesn't happen. Remember, a lot has happened leading up to this election actually happening right now. Cancellations, postponements. Now the elections are happening, but watch it to see how it goes on. Uh, but everyone now is talking about this 44-year-old man, uh, Mr. Basiru Diomaye Diakapai, who, according to local reports, is leading. Uh, of course, uh, he has quite an interesting history. Had less campaign time mm. than the other people in the past. So right. found of the past ten party. Right. So I want you to see how that works out. Yeah, Kela, I know you have a lot to tell us, but of course, we'll be catching up with you at the top of the hour to bring all of that detail because we're totally out of time. We know that Basid Yomaye Faye, uh, this is in the early lead, but Maduba, the former prime minister, is saying celebrations are premature. So we'll follow all of that. Kela Megua from Senegal, uh, no, she's Nigerian, reporting <laughs> from Dakar in Senegal. Thank you for bringing us that update. Thank you. And that's it on the program. Thanks for your time and company. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Bye-bye.